listens, <laughs> which is fine, long as he's hearing it. But please, she hasn't discovered that yet. Active learning versus passive learning. Guys, studying, you are supposed to be involved in it. You are supposed to be, ha be into it. You are supposed to be absorbing it. You are supposed to be taking it in. You're supposed to be actively learning. Passively learning is sitting back, reading it through, answering your phone, hoping your phone will ring, um, looking at the ceiling. Um, oh, yeah, what was I doing? Go back to my notes, read it all over again, because I'm not bored enough, so I'm going to read it over again. Passive learning is uh, lying on the couch, one eye on the TV, one eye on the books, trying to get it in. Don't waste your time. Life's too short. Rather watch the movie. It's probably going to be more educational than trying to study like that. If you fall asleep on your bed, it's going to be better for you than trying to study on your bed. Sleep is going to be better for you than studying if that's the way you're going to study. You are completely wasting your time. Rather take 20 minutes of active learning than two hours of passive learning. But I will show you. Okay, this guy here, I mean this was actually one of my pupils, who when I was teaching him how to study, his mom bought him a whiteboard for his room. And he studies only with that now. He draws it, he writes it, he teaches it, he does his mind maps. He's involved. You can't be involved in your work and concentration or uh, concentra concentration going or you getting so distracted. Because when you're involved in your work, you don't get that, what else should I do? Back to the brain. Right, the brain. As you can see, we've got both sides. Now we've got all the characteristics. Now we've got to start using it. And that's the good news. We have both these sides. We have to now make a conscious effort, guys, to strengthen the weaker side. Leaders, managers, a lot of the corporate courses that I do, we use a lot of the left brain and right brain. The leaders and the managers tend to use both sides of the, well, they do, they use both sides of the brain. Even though they might be more dominant in the one side, they use both. They always say that leaders should use the right brain, the creative one, they're leading everybody, they're getting everybody going, and the managers use more of the left side. What a lot of people do, some of the most successful people that I know in the courses and the seminars that I've done where people have come from overseas to do it, they are using both sides of their brain. The way in which your brain thinks, guys, you are going to decide in which way you think. Thoughts, by the way, don't just come. Thoughts are controlled by us. Okay? So the way in which you think will determine how your brain absorbs the information, how your brain processes that information, and how you're going to recall it from memory. So we're going to choose the way we think. Let's quickly talk about our memory. Okay, I have explained a lot of this to them in class. A memory, it, the memory is not something that you open up your brain and go, oh, there's the memory. Okay, the memory is sort of, <coughs> sorry, loads of connections in the brain. And what happens is when you have this fabulous experience in your life, your brain rewires itself. Now, I'm not talking junk. This is what we actually did in this brain surgeon course thing where we kind of opened a brain and looked at all the connections. And what actually happens is when you have this incredible experience in your life that say something really good happened, maybe you got a really good birthday present years ago and you just loved it and you remember that day, or something tragic, something sad. We remember so much stuff from years ago because that, that has actually been rewired in your brain to create a memory. Now, that sounds all quite hectic, but actually it's quite simple. When we're trying to remember stuff, <clears throat> it's a very big stress. And I can't stand seeing pupils trying to remember information that they've studied, that they've put in the time, put in the hours. It is a completely unnecessary stress. Total waste of time. Because they are learning in the short-term memory. Now, we have, through tests, these were memory tests done, discovered that we have a short-term memory, we have a long-term memory. The short-term memory, as I explained to the kids, sucks. Nothing. Do you know the short-term memory lasts 30 seconds? For example, you've got to phone a friend, or you got to, your mom asks you to phone someone. Uh, mom, what's the number? Just give me the number. Okay, sweetheart, it's um, 7051396. Hold on, mom. 7051396. Oh, it's engaged. What was the number again, mom? Okay, short-term memory. It's really left your memory. But you've got a friend's number, or someone you really like's number. It's etched into your long-term memory. <laughs> know the number. 
can remember numbers from years and years and years ago. Why? Because something happened up here that made him quite nice to remember his number. Something happened up here that reconnected some of my wires to think that's worth storing. Oh, and he was nice. Okay, the memory. Quick breakdown of the memory. This is how our memory works, okay? Perception. In other words, we perceive something. So you look at something and you perceive it. So you decide, oh, that's this, that's quite nice, yes, I like it. Maybe you use your emotions on it. Maybe you use your senses on it. Maybe you don't like it. Maybe you do like it, okay? You then decide whether it's worth storing it. In other words, is it significant to store? Which is why, guys, so often in the mornings, particularly, we forget things. Like, you, you, you're going on your daily lives and, and you wonder why you leave your tog bag at the door when you know you've got hockey that afternoon, but you, you're still leaving your lunchbox behind. And quite honestly, I wouldn't stress about that. Because they're mundane daily things. I know parents are going to say, why are you saying this? I know my kids leave their, their bags behind all the time. But if we had to, if we didn't have a filter in our memory, we would leave the house at 7 in the morning with our memory so full we wouldn't be able to take anything else in. So I'm quite glad I've got a filter that filters out some stuff. Husband filters out far too much, but that's beside the point. And then we have our retrieval. In other words, I've stored it. Is it significant? Can I recall it? Okay, just giving you the basics here so we can start. As I said to you, take experiences in, in, your, in your life. This was a live experience. Somebody getting something that they really want, a great party. Okay, she's getting what she wants. She's like, oh, I'm gonna, this is worth storing. Okay, remember your first bike. Do you remember your first bike? That definitely got connections rewired. That feeling, I bet you if you had to go back to the day you got your first bike, you'd remember it. You remember falling. You remember doing it. You remember riding it. You remember that feeling of this is my own bike. Bet you don't remember what you read yesterday experiences. Remember winning something, achieving something. Memories are based on our senses and on our experiences. Long-term memory. If you want to study, we need to turn our studies into experiences, using our senses, taking it in, using our emotions. I used an example of a movie with all the kids. We took The Lion King, remember? I said to them, do you all remember The Lion King? Yes, I always use The Lion King because it's just such a fabulous movie. I mean, there's color, there's sound, there's emotion. And when I started talking about the movie with the kids in the class, they were like, oh yeah, I remember that. Mufasa. <laughs> and I'm like, even the way they said it, it was just like in the movie. And they remembered the music when they held Simba up and this triumphant music. And then, of course, we got carried away with the Lion King. And I started saying, you saw that movie, what, 10 years ago? You remember it. It's stored. There were emotions involved. I remember crying. I remember laughing. I remember even when Scar scraped his nails against the side of the cave. And I remember feeling that, oh, those goosebumps. And when we do that, guys, that's how you get it in your long-term memory. Short-term memory. We've got to avoid it. We've got to avoid it. We don't need that stress of going blank in a test. <clears throat> I love this. I just had to put it on. If you can't read it, it says, these drugs will affect your short-term memory, so you better pay me now. Okay, which, which basically means you've got 30 seconds to pay me and your short-term memory is going. Okay, when we watch a movie, let's say you watch a really funny movie. Okay, it's hysterical. You're really enjoying this movie. You're going to remember it. You watch a scary movie. <laughs> okay, or a movie that really grabs your concentration. I guarantee if I had to walk into that room with that little one watching TV, he wouldn't even hear me come into the room. He's involved in the movie. He's in the movie. He might as well be there. Now, when you're studying, how involved are you in your studying? How deeply into it are you? To the point that if your mom had to come in and say, you can stop studying now, you wouldn't even hear her. <laughs> we need to take experiences in. We need color. We need sound. We need it to come through our eyes to get into our long-term memory. 
this studying part where you guys are sitting there reading over your work, trying to get it all in, feeling stressed, realizing the volumes of work that you have to do, you might as well not do it. This was a test. This was actually a research thing that we did. <clears throat> we got these kids to watch the Jaws movie in, in water. And they were doing this. <laughs> because it just shows how exaggeration, I mean, if any of you have seen Jaws, it is completely exaggerated. And those divers will know that sharks do not do 90% of what they did in that movie. But it wouldn't have made a good movie if they didn't come literally into your ship and knock on your window. Okay, sharks don't do that. But it was quite amazing to let them actually be involved with their senses. Do you think they ever forgot that movie? No. Their toes were like, oof, just. Who listens to music while they study? Oh, you're so cool. <laughs> when you're watching a movie, you don't go to the cinema or you get a DVD at home and you don't say, Laka, come, we're going to watch this movie. Turn off the lights, get our popcorn. Oh, mom, just put a DVD on, turn it up. No, because you're like, shut up. I can't hear. Even if someone's talking to you during the movie, be quiet. I can't hear. And I've done a test. I go, I've got twins. I go to a movie with my son. Not a word. He sits there, popcorn. Movie's going in through the eyes. Just sits there. My daughter. What happened? What is that? I missed that. What happened there? Oh. Now I go to do different movies with them. The one movie I watched with my son, I remember everything. Everything. Because I can't talk to him. He won't listen. And he, I wouldn't even know if I'm there. Okay? I go with my daughter. We get home. And my husband says, well, how was the movie? I, yeah, I think it was good. What is it about? I don't know. I, don't know. I can't remember. Because you're distracted. And yet when you study, you're happy to be distracted. You can't have something in going into your right brain going into your left brain, where's the studying going to go? Rather listen to the music. You're going to enjoy it more. Oh, the parents are wondering why they came tonight. Okay. Absolutely pointless trying to study when you're tired. Total waste of time. Don't do it. Don't do it. Your brain, the connections and the wires have stopped. Nothing's going to go through. You might say, yeah, but what if it's an emergency? I'm going to show you how to avoid the emergencies. Okay, this girl was actually, um, <laughs> she'd written her name on the paper, and um, yeah, that was it, went to sleep. Okay, so you cannot remember things when you're tired or when you're unhappy. Don't even try and use your memory in cases like that. Rather go to sleep, get up earlier. If you say, no way, I can't do that, <laughs> I'll be honest with you guys, there's more to life then, because it's not going to go in anyway. Memory skills, memory games. Okay, we have done tests on people who focus, especially the moms and dads. And I used to do that till I learned these, these, that how our memory works. I often used to say, my daughter would say, Mom, why did you forget th that I was doing tennis this afternoon? I'd say, oh, Amy, it's my age. I can't remember. Because you start focusing on that. What you focus on is what you get. Remember, guys, the story I told you about the two racing car drivers? They were, one was focused on the walls, one was focused on the gap. The one car hit the wall, the other one went through the gap. What you focus on is what you get. You focus on having a strong memory, you'll have a strong memory till 97. Okay. You're not going to need a bigger brain. You have a memory, you have a left and right brain. You're not going to need a bigger one. We need to fine tune what we've got. Quick example. Take a cell phone number. I give you a number. 03442 Repeat it. Oh. As soon as you break it up, it's easier to remember. Because we all know numbers start with either 083 or 082 or 07, whatever. Okay? As soon as you break it up, it's easier to remember. That is a simple memory strategy. Guys, as I said to you, there's no fancy way of trying to log things into your long-term memory. It's about finding ways to remember it, finding little strategies. For example, if I say to you, here's five words, remember them. Um, bird, television, um, juice. Okay, in two weeks' time, if I had to ask you what, okay, tomorrow, okay, sorry, nine o'clock, if I had to ask you what those three words are, don't worry, I won't keep you till nine, you wouldn't remember them. But if you create a picture or a way of trying to remember them, what did I say? Bird, television, juice. So immediately I make a quick picture of myself. There's the bird sitting on top of my TV drinking Oros. Stupid picture, but I've made a picture. 
because long-term memory, right brain, needs pictures. How many of us, when you are studying, are finding memory strategies, finding ways? A lot of you are. I know a lot of you are. I can see it in your assessments. You're finding ways to picture things. Remember, guys, in your classes, that picture of the brain that I showed you? We found a way to remember it. Some of you, I showed you a fern leaf, inside a fern leaf, a grade 11 diagram. I was showing to the grade 9. We were finding ways. We turned the whole thing into like a, a gym, a health spa, by turning it into pictures. I'm going to show you a quick technique again, how to use a map. This is something that, oh, sorry, how to learn a map. This is something that you can actually take home and learn. I found a map, I took a map of Australia. Okay, now, it's right-brained. So it's just creative, it's a map. I don't know all the cities, I don't know all the places, I don't know all the names. Okay, so I turn it into a left brain structure too. By putting straight lines over it, breaking it up into small parts, like I explained about the left brain, okay, and working with one part at a time. So I number it, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Then what I do is I learn one block at a time, and I look in block number one. Okay, it's difficult to see, but in block number one, we have iron, so obviously iron is mined there in that part of Australia, and we have Yampi sound. So what I do is I create a memory strategy. I say, all right, block number one I always know is top left. Now I've got to associate Yampi with iron. Immediately your brain shuts off. Well, I don't know. How do I have, how what iron got to do with Yampi sound? Okay, I drop an iron pole on your foot and I want you all to scream, Yampi! Okay, go. Imagine this iron pole being dropped on your toe. Go! Oh. Come on, guys. Yampy, 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 that iron. You've got to feel the pain. You've got to feel the emotion. You've got to feel that yampy because I'm not allowed to say anything else. Okay, that's creative juices. And you see when the kids that I teach how to study are running around, they're going, yampy. Yabby, and your mom's going, what are you doing? You're going, I don't know, I just dropped an iron pole on my toe. She's going, what are you doing? You go, I'm studying the map of Australia. <laughs> because in block number one is iron and yampy sound. Block number two, we've got Darwin and we've got iron again. Now when I see Darwin, sorry, I know it's not clear. I don't know why you can't see that. It's clear on here. Darwin, I immediately think of the monkey in um, Wild Thornberries. Remember that? Remember little Darwin the monkey? Oh, you're so cute. You guys don't get out much, do you? Okay. Anyway, the wild thornberry's Darwin was this cute little monkey. Now I've got to associate Darwin with iron again. So when I think of irons, I also think of golf, irons. Okay, so I imagine little Darwin playing golf. And he's taking out his irons and little Darwin there is playing his golf. So I've made a quick picture. And this is what I do. I go to each one. Number three, at the top we have weeper. In the middle we have Cairns and Townsville. And all I do is I make a picture of the three cities, the three places. Weeper, weeper, weeper. I'm weeping. Oh, I'm weeping. Oh, don't just go, oh, I'm weeping. You haven't tapped into your imagination. I'm weeper. Oh, I'm weeper. Crying these paddles below me. Next one is Cairns. Cairns. Nobody cares! Nobody cares for me! You've got to be saying it because auditory, it's sound. Townsville. Now, when I think of Townsville, what do you think of? So you do watch Cartoon Network. Okay. Powerpuff Girls come from the city of Townsville. Okay, so now quickly make my connection. I'm weeper. I'm weeper. One of the little Powerpuff Girls come up and say, what's the matter? And I say, nobody cares, nobody cares. Come with us to the city of Townsville and we will help you. And off I'll go to Townsville with the Powerpuff Girls. Now, I might have taken 40 seconds to make that picture in my head, but you get this map in your test. You don't see the map of Australia. You see block one, block two, block three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That's something in your memory already. We call it peg mnemonics. We take what you know already, and we peg it onto something that you don't know, like the map of Australia. You can count to 1 to 10. No matter how blank you go, guys, in tests, you will be able to count from 1 to 10. Break things up. I'll show you hundreds of memory strategies you can use. 
So, you know, block number one, block number one. Oh, yeah, what happened? Oh, yes, the iron landed on my toe and I made a... Right, made a yampy sound. So, you know, number one, yampy sound, iron. Number two, oh, yes, that was little Dar and the monkey. Oh, he was playing golf with the irons. You don't play golf with coppers or gold or... Okay, so you take out the iron. So, we know, block number two in Australia, that's pretty much the middle, okay, at, up north. We've got Darwin, iron. Block number three. Oh, yeah. That was down the, that side of Australia, down the east coast, at the top. Oh, yeah. I was weeper. Yes, weepers at the top. Why? Because nobody cares. And then Townsville. You're not going to put Townsville first. And then what was I doing? I, no one cares. Oh, yeah. I was we No, you're going to get your story straight. Memory strategy. Plus, guys, when you're studying, it's stimulating your concentration. It's getting your mind going. Going into your long-term memory. This is another technique I can teach you. Parents, when you're testing your kids at home, you know there's nothing worse than when you say, Mom, please test me. What does she do? She nails you with the hardest question first. <laughs> oh, you haven't studied. Go back to your room. Oh, Mom, just ask me one more. Just one. Okay. The, she asks you a question like you're a parrot, straight out of the book. Okay, I I'll, ask, I'll ask Dad to test me. Dad, on the other hand, wants to discuss everything. <laughs> Dad wants to talk about everything and eventually you're thinking, you know what, I've studied this, I'm now doing another hour. Moms and dads, when you test them, rather than testing them on the knowledge, test them on their memory strategies, rather say to them, how did you remember this? My daughter was doing Zulu this afternoon and they were doing all the colours in Zulu. And instead of me saying, what's blue? Oh, you don't know that, go back and learn. I was going, how did you remember what blue is in Zulu? And then she'd give me her connection. She'd give me her picture. This is how mom, because this part of the word reminds me of this. And, th and that's how we remembered it. Take things in your life that you remember from your own experiences to get that into your long-term memories, to connect all those little wires in your memory. <clears throat> remember what I said about the auditory. If you teach it out loud, active learning rather than passive learning, you're going to hear it. You're going to understand it. You can't talk about something if you don't understand it. If I didn't understand what I was talking about, I wouldn't remember what to tell you guys. If you understand it, you'll remember it. Okay. We're going to stay with the times here. Okay? We're going to learn to enjoy studying. We're going to learn to relax when we're studying. And we're going to grow with the times. We're going to grow beyond our wildest imaginations. Because what I'm going to do now, guys, is I'm going to give you some skills. I'm going to go through how, ways in which you can turn your mind around about studying. I've shown you what the brain can do. I've shown you that your memory has got a long-term memory and a short-term memory. Now I'm going to start showing you how to put your mind in the right place. When you want to exercise your brain, concentrate on the side that you don't normally use. For example, my, my right side, not that creative. I try and tap into things. Just because you can't draw, remember, it doesn't mean you're not creative. So I try to tap into things. And I've realized how much I actually do use my right brain. I'm creative with ideas. I'm creative with setting the table at Christmas time. I'm creative about things like that. I'm creative about music. So start realizing, if you're not very organized and you don't plan things and you're always late and your life's chaotic, don't just say, oh, that's just the way I am. You're shutting off half your brain. You're slamming it shut. Start trying to get a bit more organized. Start trying to maybe plan things. Start trying to maybe keep a diary or even just a little list of things to remember. And you will start training that other side to get your whole brain learning. When you're studying, ask yourself, am I, am I breaking things into parts? Am I using some kind of structure here? And where am I using my imagination? Some people don't use the imagination at all when they're studying, which means they're using about 3% of their brain. What I'm going to explain to you now, guys, <clears throat> this world that we live in, it's just matter. It's just geography. It's just a planet. It's just stuff. We, on the other hand, have this mind that can create absolutely anything. We have infinite choices. We decide everything. Our thoughts mold our lives into our realities. We experience things. So nobody can blame the world on choices, decisions, circumstances, 
things that happen. Because we're the ones that have got the mind. We are the ones that are actively involved in this world. The world is just a matter. If I just say to you all, um, is the world good or bad? I'm going to get different views. Well, I don't know, some are, I don't know, something both, something one or the other, something. It depends which glasses you have on, and it depends how you are looking at the world. Do you know that everything, and I don't stand to be corrected, everything is a perception. Do you know what that means? It means how we perceive it. For example, failure. If you fail at something, it's a perception. I, I can't fail. I don't have, I was telling the kids, I don't have the word, I call it the F word, we're not allowed to use it. It's a, it, the word fail you are not allowed to use because if there is no such word, you can't feel it. And failure is something that we perceive. You might look at me and go, Joanne, you did fail. 32% for that test. Joanne, that is a fail. And I'm like, no, it's not. It's a learning experience, remember? I learn more, guys, from my failures than what I do from my successes. In fact, most of the failures that I know are failures because they haven't failed enough. Every single successful, effective human being that I know has got more failures behind them than successes. Why? Because you learn from failures. Now I've got the moms and dads going, okay, you can be quiet now. I said to all the kids in the class when I was working them, I said, right, everybody, look up, sit up. I want you all please to misarrogate. And I went, what? I went, come on, misarrogate. They're like, what do we do? I said, you can't do it, can you? You can't do it because there's no such word. So if there was no such word as fail, could you fail? <laughs> you know what saying I really hate? I'm only human. You know, when we do something bad, or we mess up, or we stuff up, what's our excuse? I'm only human. What does that mean? What does that mean? That is a myth that human beings are flawed. They are, they are inadequate. I'm only human. But when you do something really good, brilliant, genius, in fact, everybody keeps telling you, well done, that was fabulous. You really stretched yourself as a human being to do that. And you start going, yeah, yeah, all right, okay. And, you know, we're all the first to go, I oh, know, I really stuffed up, I'm only human. But when we do something good, and everyone's telling you something good, yeah, okay, thanks, oh, it wasn't that great. Anyway, okay, and eventually after a while, you start to think, yeah, that was good. But you don't stand up there and say, I'm a genius. I'm human. That's why I did it. Which is actually more natural and appropriate to the human, because what humans have, we should be geniuses. You know, Thomas Edison, very, very famous American inventor, very powerful, rich, motivated man. So when he says something, I want to hear. I wrote it down so I didn't get it wrong. He said, quote, if we did all the things we were capable of doing, we would literally astonish ourselves. So we as human beings, start to, we have to start to realize that what we have up here, we are capable of of doing anything, anything with these brains. What I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you to please eliminate the word failure from your vocabulary. Pretend there is no such word and watch what happens. Guys, the techniques I'm teaching you tonight are going to be simple. They're going to be things like take the word failure out. Take the word stress out of your vocabulary. How can you feel stress if you don't know what stress is? Don't use the word. If your moms and dads come home from work and you say, how was your day? Oh, I'm so stressed. Change the word. Change it to, how was your day? Busy. How was your day? Challenging. Because what you say can empower you or disempower you. We've got to watch our words. One thing that's very important that I want you all to realize is that our circumstances in our life, our conditions in our lives, are perceptions. How many of you think that I'm happy when my circumstances are good, I'm sad when my circumstances are bad? We as human beings have the power to decide what to do with those circumstances. You know, you are what you're given, hey? We're all given a...